Good afternoon. Uh, welcome, everyone. On behalf of the FIU Holocaust and Genocide Studies Program in the Stephen J. Green School of International and Public Affairs, it's my pleasure to welcome you to, to today's event, Last Days of Theresienstadt, the Eyewitness Testimony of Eva Noak Masi. I'm Oren Steer, professor in the Department of Religious Studies and director of the Holocaust and Genocide Studies Program at FIU. Before we begin, I'd like to thank our co-sponsors, Books and Books, the Jewish Museum of Florida, FIU, the Ruth K. and Shepard Broad Distinguished Lecture Series, the European and Eurasian Studies Program, the Václav Havel Program for Human Rights and Democracy, and the FIU Department of History. And I'd also just like to thank our SIPA staff, uh, the tech team, Jocelyn, thank you very much for being there, and everyone who helped make today's conversation possible. The FIU Holocaust and Genocide Studies Program is concerned with offering the university and the broader South Florida community numerous opportunities to study the Holocaust and other cases of genocide and mass violence. The program's curriculum includes lectures, film screenings, cultural exhibitions, and course offerings in these topics. Through this curriculum and drawing on a rich network of interdisciplinary faculty members, the program strives to educate and raise awareness about the darkest of moments in history. By approaching the Holocaust and cases of genocide through a multidisciplinary perspective, the program allows students and community members alike to understand the interconnections among history, art, society, and culture, and how these can impact society in beneficial or detrimental ways. And I wanna let everybody know that even though we're in the Zoom era, our programming and activities continue. Uh, we continue to do teacher trainings. We continue to have lectures, including our upcoming annual Holocaust and Genocide Awareness Week in January. Our partnership with the Jewish Museum of Florida, FIU, uh, which is a co-sponsor of today's program, uh, continues strongly. Um, and we continue to promote research and faculty, student, and community engagement. As part of our lecture and outreach programming each year, the Holocaust and Genocide Studies program sponsors events centered on a particular location associated with the Holocaust. Last academic year, the focus was Auschwitz, and we hosted an academic symposium, a museum exhibition, and a film screen. This year's focus is Theresienstadt, the notorious camp ghetto that served at least three purposes. It was a transit camp for deported Czech Jews on their way to killing centers. It was a ghetto labor camp for German, Austrian, and Czech Jews, many of whom were noted cultural figures. Indeed, the site was known for continued cultural productivity, and it was a holding pen for these Jews. Theresienstadt was also infamous for serving as an elaborately staged hoax for the International Red Cross who visited in June 1944 and fell for the intricate disguise that presented the camp as something like a retirement spa town. Today's conversation is the first event of what we hope will be a series probing the legacy of Theresienstadt, continuing in the spring semester. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker and moderator. Dr. Sky Doney is the director of the George L. Massey Program in History that's at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He translated, edited, and annotated Eva Noak Masi's Holocaust memoir, Last Days of Theresienstadt, on which today's conversation is based. His articles have appeared most recently in the Catholic Historical Review and Environment Space Place. Currently, he's completing a manuscript on German Catholic religious practices between the 1830s and the 1930s. Today's conversation will be moderated by Dr. Terence Peterson, who's an assistant professor in the Department of History at FIU, a former Mossy Fellow at UW-Madison and a member of our Holocaust and Genocide Studies Program Coordinating Committee. He's published articles in the Journal of Contemporary History and French Politics, Culture and Society, as well as popular outlets like War on the Rocks, He's currently finishing a book on the Algerian war and the origins of modern counter insurgency. Sky and Terry, we're looking forward to your conversation. Take it away. Thank you, Oren, for that lovely introduction. Uh, thank you, Sky, for, for joining us today. Um, what we kind of envisioned was to have a conversation about this really fascinating memoir uh, for a while and then open it up to questions so that we can really give you a sense of 
this book um, and uh, the insights that it gives into uh, not just Theresien Stadt, but life uh, under the Nazi regime. And, uh, you know, I figured, Sky, the, the, the sort of most logical place to start would be to talk about Eva Noak Mossi. Who was she uh, and what happened to lead her to write this diary? That way we can sort of get a sense of the woman behind the, the, the diary. Sure. Um... Well, thank you, thank you, Terry. Thank you, Oren. Thank you for every everyone for working on this. Um, happy to talk about about Ava's experiences. If I'm going on too long, Terry, at any point, just tell me you want to you want to <laughs> shift gears. But it's I mean the the question we you want to start with is a big question. Um, Ava Noak Masi, she's she's a Jewish woman living in Germany. Um, she's around. She's 30 years old when Hitler comes to power in January of 1933. The following year, she got married to her fiance, uh, Moritz, who happens to be a, an Aryan. Uh, that's 1934. The Nazis will pass the famous Nuremberg laws in 1935 that would prohibit such marriages between a Jew and an Aryan. Um, so they make it before, before the prohibition. The Nazis don't directly target initially such mixed marriages. They're, they're paranoid about undermining public morale. There are around 14,000 of them in Germany um, throughout the Third Reich. Um, after they're married, Eva and Moritz, they stay in Berlin until 1941, at which point as the war situation um, is deteriorating or it's starting to turn in Germany and there's increasing pressure on German Jews in Berlin, they decide to move and they go to a small village called Oberstdorf in the southwest of Germany. Um, in November of 1944, Moritz is summoned before the Gestapo and they harass him for marrying an, a Jewish woman. And they also plan to deport him for, for forced labor. Um, after a medical inspection, he's sent home. But this is really alarming for both Eva and for Moritz. And so after that November 1944 summons, they think that their, their, their experience, which has already included harassment um, and persecution, is worsening. And so that's what prompts Ava to start writing down her experiences. Uh, and it turns out that sense of foreboding is correct. So Ava shortly thereafter receives her own summons to go from Oberstdorf to Augsburg to report for what she thinks will be forced labor. Um, it turns out after she uh, reports and she gets on the train, two of the women on the train know for sure that they're heading for Theresienstadt. And as they continue to travel, it becomes clear to the 50 other women that they're all, they're all being deported to Theresienstadt. Um, there are lots of things from Ava's experience that are really surreal. And one of them is that she's able to smuggle a postcard out of the train as they're being transported. And so Moritz knows that she's being sent, she's pretty sure, to, to Theresienstadt. Um, but it's that, that November 1944 summons that he received that prompts her to, to write down her, her own experiences. So already Ava sort of occupies this really fascinating space within German society, right? Because she's not deported early. The German government sort of holds off, right, until very late, uh, you know, and unlike many Aryan spouses married to a Jewish person, her husband doesn't sort of give into that, that cultural pressure to divorce her and sort of allow her to be deported. And so she, she is deported, but at a very unique moment, right? She's, she sort of understands that the war is winding down, although they don't know when, right? right. And so, you know, she has this sense of, of sort of a historic gravitas throughout. She's also an interesting person because she's part of a really prominent German Jewish family, right? The Mossi family. Uh, her cousin, George L. Mossi, is sort of the namesake of the program you run, right? right. A, a program where I was a fellow uh, in graduate school. Uh, who, who is this Mossi family? Because I think this is really important for sort of like understanding who Ava is and why we have this, this source today. Uh, the Mossi family, they are, like you say, they're very well known. They're fully, they're these, they're integrated. They're an important German Jewish family. I can give you maybe just a couple of like touch points on this. Um, Ava's great uncle, 
is Rudolf Mossy. He's a famous publisher and advertiser. Uh, he made a fortune coordinating advertisements for newspapers. He winds up setting up offices throughout Europe, throughout no North America. He, he branches from focusing on advertising to having publications. And these include, for example, the Berliner Tageblatt, often called the, the German Times of its day. Uh, this is a voice for German liberalism throughout the, the Weimar Republic. He and his wife, Amelia, have many philanthropic um, projects. They set up orphanages, they set up shelters, they set up um, schools um, to, throughout, throughout Germany. Um, another one of Eva's great uncles, Albert Mossi, helps draft the, the Japanese constitution. Um, her own father, Max, is, is, a, is a very well-known physician. He publishes extensively on physiology, on, on microbiology, um, and her mother's family, the Labans, are similarly prominent. Her, her uncle, for example, Paul Laban, is a very famous legal scholar working out of the University of Strasbourg that helps draft a lot of the, the German legal code. Um, at the end of the diary, you can read correspondence, as you mentioned, between Ava and George. George L. Mossy is a very well-known uh, historian, um, an emigre historian who teaches at Iowa and teaches at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, um, publishes over a dozen books. So in short, the Mossys are they're a very well-known, uh, uh, prominent, a very visible uh, family within, within Germany. Yeah, and a, and a tar uh, uh, family that the Nazi regime targets, right? I mean, That's the Berliner right. Tageblatt, it's a big paper that, that puts a big sort of target on the Masi family, you know, and as a result, uh, you know, under the National Socialist regime, they see a lot of their wealth expropriated. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's still, we can get into the nitty gritty of that later if people are interested, but there's still an effort to recover some of the Masi family's art. Uh, you know, that's Aryanized and then sold. Right. Uh, her cousin George manages to escape through Switzerland to the United States. And that's part of the reason why why we have this diary, right? Members of the right. Mossy family remain sort of uh, important intellectual figures. Um, and, and Ava's diary is an interesting source, right? Because she writes it in this moment, in this very sort of unique moment at the end of the war. Uh, she also fact checks it and adds commentary later. And so I, I want to talk a little bit about this source, right? Where do we, obviously she's writing it at the time, uh, <clears throat> but where do we get this diary? How do we get from that diary to this uh, lovely published edition from, from the uh, University of Wisconsin Press, right? How, uh, how do we get this source? Well, um, it's, it's an interesting story, like you say. Um, maybe I should just quickly touch on it's both it's both a diary in one sense but it's also in another sense a memoir which professor mark roseman talks about in his foreword and i talk about in my introduction it's a diary in a in a very like traditional sense right she there are dated entries or she records experiences and we have those in this document but then she also after the war goes back and corroborates or expands on different points. So for, as one example, they're allowed to send postcards from Theresienstadt, 30 word postcards where they can't really talk about anything that's actually happening to them. She, sent, she tries to send many of those and only the very first one actually gets back to Oberstdorf. And so she includes that and only one of these postcards makes it back, right? Which she wouldn't learn about until after the war. Um, so while editing the document, what we tried to do is offset in italics these asides that, where she, she gestures toward, toward future knowledge. How did the diary come about? Well, she's got, she starts writing even before she's asked to report to the Gestapo in Augsburg. And then in the camp itself, she continues to record her experiences. Um, she takes this with her home to Oberstdorf at the end of the war, she survives. And um, after, I'm trying to think if we want to like get into what she's doing in the camp yet, or if you want to just talk about the, the document itself, but 
yeah, have let's, to. We'll, we'll get to that in a second because that's okay. really interesting, right? And it's a whole separate thing. But but let's talk about where, how we actually get this because I think that's really fascinating too. So she has this. So at the end of the war, she has the document. She's made a few changes and she starts to circulate it first among mm -hmm. friends. And then eventually in 1951, George L. Mossy travels to Germany to give a lecture at the America House and she gives him a copy. And then what follows is roughly 25 years of them corresponding about off and on about, about the document. And Ava asks him a couple of times for help, like where should I donate the diary or how do I get it published? Or maybe we could do a translation. Uh, that never, it's never, it was never published, but it was used extensively by researchers um, who, who have worked on Theresienstadt. Uh, John Tortorisi, the director emeritus of the Mossy program, who I hope is here among the attendees, had the idea to bring out, bring out a translation. Um, and so then the program undertook, undertook the project. Um, it's, it's one of these texts that sort of shows up in footnotes, right? You know, absolutely. And it's there, but it's, but it's not published, right? And so lots of scholars talk about it. This yeah. is really the first time that the general public can sort of look at this source, except for when George Mossy was lecturing his right. courses on history and, you know, really used it very heavily to talk about life uh, in Theresien Stadt. Yeah, in 19, so for example, in 1971, Mossy gave the, this first lecture series, this course on the history of European um, Jews at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Mm -hmm. And those recordings, he's, when he starts to talk about what happens to German Jews between 1933 and 1945, you can really tell that he's drawing from, from, from Ava's experiences because um, he talks a lot about mixed couples and sort yeah. of these exceptions. So, so you, you mentioned a little bit sort of what Ava is doing while she's in Theresienstadt. Uh, and, and I want to pick back up on that because it's really fascinating, right? Because, you know, th this isn't just sort of a diary of, of what Ava's doing day to day, although a lot of that shows up in it, right? Because surviving in the tough conditions of the camp requires a lot of work on a daily basis. And so she works, uh, you know, sort of very hard in the diary as well to, to recount all of the steps she has to sort of go through. But she occupies a really interesting place within the camp in terms of the work that she's asked to do. And so it makes this diary uh, an interesting source for a lot of reasons. Do you, do you want to talk a little bit about what she's doing and sure. how that shows up in here? Um, well, so we, we, when we were talking about this relationship of the diary to the memoir, which one is it, um, sort of hard to parse out, that tension is partly due to the fact that when Ava arrives in Theresienstadt, um, by the way, the diary is littered with these really interesting, um, intimate moments. So when she arrives, one of the women that she's, she's befriended on the train, Ilsa, looks at her and says, we will never leave this place alive. Um, after she's processed, it's called the sluice. You know, her hair is shorn, her property is taken, um, and she's deloused, et cetera, and put and turned over to the general camp population. She is a typist and a journalist. And so she's put in this office called Central Evidence, Central Evidence. And the whole point of Central Evidence is to type up lists and identity cards. Um, lists, uh, they make all these lists. They're largely trying to guess, it turns out, what the Nazis want. So they, they organize, for example, inmates based on where have they arrived from. They organize them based on where, what nationality are they? When did they arrive? When were they deported east, et cetera? Because they never know when the SS is gonna come into the office and demand information organized in a certain way. Um, but while working in Zentral Evidence, she has access to all of this statistical information. And that is, is, is really important to her. She wants to make sure that that information is preserved. Um, the day-to-day the -day work itself, we can talk about statistics later, but the day-to-day -day work itself, she has to report to work at 7.30 a.m. She's done at seven o'clock at night. Um, this position though gives her access to paper and so she's able to to continue to record what happens to her um, 
And here I might make just a quick aside as to why we undertook the translation. I mean, John had the idea yeah. to do so, uh, but I think it's, we published it. Uh, one of the real motivators for this was that it's clear in that correspondence with Mossy that she really wanted her voice added to, to the chorus mm -hmm. of voices that was, that was testifying about the crimes of the Holocaust. And she, she has this sense that what she found in Central Evidence and her experiences are unique. And I, that's absolutely true. Um, you guys are gonna have some other events on Theresienstadt that look more at the cultural life. Well, by the time Ava arrives in February, 1945, that sort of heyday of lectures by Rabbi Leo Beck and lectures by people who were in the Prague circle or who knew the Kafka family uh, has largely diminished because the camp has been so depopulated from a height of around 62,000 people to around 17,000 when, when she arrives. Um, so it's unique, not only because she, she arrives after many of the people who will uh, write, write diaries or record their experiences have been sent elsewhere, people like Philip Maines or um, Gondor Edlich. Uh, and it's also unique because she continues to record after the war ends. So we learn or we get this first, this like ground, this, 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 this view of, of the SS fleeing, of the International Red Cross arriving, of the Russian army arriving, and just this interesting continuity of camp life because she still needs to work in Zentral Evidence even after, um, after the liberation to help coordinate and to organize information. Um, yeah, the diary really offers this fascinating uh, coda to what we usually think of, about when we think about Theresienstadt. You know, when we think about this cultural life and this foment and this, you know, this very crowded camp uh, full of people trying to survive who are then deported. You know, Ava's there really after that. Uh, and, and, you know, the fact that her memoir does stretch out to the period after the camps over, you know, after Nazi rule of the camp is over, right? A single man from the International Red Cross sort of comes up to, comes in to run the camp. Uh, you know, and maybe potentially saves uh, it's, it's, you know, the people inside yeah. by declaring that it's under the protection of the Red Cross. Yeah. And then the Soviets arrive and she continues to essentially do the same work every day. Food gets a little bit better. They're really dealing with this major outbreak of typhus. And so conditions are still very harsh. It's an, it's a, it's a very different portrait from the one that we often get. Right. And I think it's helpful in sort of grounding that. I mean, the, the other part of her account that you that you touch on with the statistics is that, you know, she seems very concerned with sort of proving that despite this survival on the part of the the, the Jews who are interned in Theresienstadt, you know, this cultural life they try to foster in the midst of these difficult conditions, she seems really intent to prove that it is really difficult, right? I was struck by one entry where she lists these Red Cross aid packages that have been received, right? She's got sort of the, the receipt uh, to, to receive these and she's listing all the meat and the cheese yeah. and the milk powder and everything. And it's sandwiched in between these accounts of how she's eating thin soup with maybe a bit of potato and their hard, dark bread ration that is supposed to be stretched out, you know, over the course of two days. Uh, and so you really get a there's a striking sort of intentionality behind a lot of what she's choosing to include. Uh, you know, you, you get a sense that she wants to make a document that will attest to uh, the very difficult conditions that she and, and other, other people are subjected to in this camp. Yeah, that's all, yeah, true. And she also, she's also witnessing efforts to cover up evidence. So for example, in, the, in April, while she's there, the SS start burning identity cards of everyone who has been sent east. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there are, over the course of its life in Theresienstadt, at least 90,000 people are sent mm -hmm. from the, the camp itself elsewhere. And of those, 3,000 or less survive. Um, so that when she's in the camp, there's this sense of loss and of emptiness. I mean, 
15,000 children were deported from Theresienstadt East and fewer than 100 of them survive. Um, she talks about how people remember children being in the camp and she's only ever seen sort of one child in, in the camp, right? And yeah. one of the things that's most striking, right, is because, uh, you know, because the camp administrators are destroying documents on such a uh, massive scale, she can't, she can't really provide a list of names, right? In the same way that she lists these other statistics, but she does give really com a compelling sense of the scale, right? She talks about how there is this massive documentary production, right? Every person gets seven identity cards that are sent to different offices mm -hmm. within Theresienstadt that detail not just who that individual is, but their entire family, right? Yeah. Any family links that they might have uh, within the camp or elsewhere. And, and she talks about coming across cards that are slated to be destroyed, you know, because everyone on that card, not just the individual, but all those family links have been deported to the East, deported to Poland, to Auschwitz. Yeah. And so it's really a, a very striking memoir in terms of, uh, you know, a striking document in terms of marking just the scale of, of what happened sort of in its aftermath, even as she's still experiencing camp life itself. It's also, it's intensely personal because she has 17 family members and friends who have been sent to Theresienstadt and she learns through her work in Zentral Evidence that they're all, they've all died. They've either been sent East or they died in Theresienstadt waiting to be sent East. Um, the food thing, I mean, food is a constant theme of, of the memoir. How many, how much food should we bring with for deportation? Uh, yeah. And the, the Red Cross thing, I think that I really, it's important to her that she records all of those food packages because people are living on starvation rations and yet she knows that there's all of this, all of this cheese, all of this meat, all of these crackers, sar tins of sardines that are available and are just sitting in a warehouse um, that have been sent by the Red Cross and by Scandinavian countries that are just not being distributed or only the SS have access to them. So yeah, and when the Red Army shows up, right, those rations start appearing. Yeah. By, by the way, I want to just, as an aside, I want to mention to members of the audience, you can post questions in the Q&A at any time, right? We're, uh, we want to leave time to answer those questions. And as we sort of work our way uh, through the book, you know, feel free to, uh, to leave them and, and we'll definitely uh, get to them. Uh, you know, one thing you, you mentioned, it's a very personal account, right? And, uh, you know, this sort of the shadow of her family being in the camp is an interesting aspect, right? She comes across Martha Mossy, uh, who she's able to, you know, who's a member of her family, it's her aunt, right? And, and she's able to sort of connect with Martha. And they, I think they work in the same office. Is, is that correct? Because Martha is one of the first police prosecutors in, in Berlin, female? No, Martha is not, not in, in Zentral Evidence. Um, okay. But. but she, but she sort of, you know, there, there is this sort of semblance of uh, life at the same time as there is this, you know, sort of enormous loss where, where she's reconnecting with people that she once knew, uh, knew before. And uh, it's, it's interesting to me to see in, in this memoir, the sort of the importance of community. Yeah. Right, the importance of, of always having, she says, you know, everybody has somebody in some important place who looks out for them, you know, and that's really striking here. So even though it's Theresienstadt at a moment when it's been emptied out, right, and conditions are still really difficult, you really get a sense here that there is a community of people that are supporting each other, um, you know, and really making life in this camp uh, tolerable. Yeah, um, the community is essential. She's assigned to a room with 16 other women initially, and they, they share whatever books that they've brought with them. Um, you, you also touched a little bit about, you know, what we talked about what makes this unique and how the camp life is a bit different. I think I could maybe make a couple more points on that. Um, not only does she arrive towards the end of the war and there's this tension between the diary and the, the memoir, 
but I think one of the things that this gives us that's really unique is you get both these like really micro interactions coupled with a macro perspective. So micro, like as she, she calls Moritz from Augsburg to tell him that she's about to get on the train and he can't really say anything besides may, may God protect you. You get micro like um, how much does it cost to take a bath? Um, yeah. with this fake camp money. You get micro things like she brings in perfume to work after she finally gets her luggage. And this just seems to make everyone's day <laughs> because it's fabulous this moment, sense right? of normalcy or yeah. a pre-war life that, that they think they've been out, the SS couldn't take that away, right? So they, they have that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's coupled also then with this real, all of these passages that I think are really moving because it's so weird for her having had having been with her her husband right up until almost the end of the war to then be put into this context so she talks about like walking along the walls of the fortress of Theresienstadt and she can look down and see the holocaust unfolding in the camp with starvation and death and disease but she can also look out into the countryside and she, it's like this weird she writes about like, quote, the perfection of nature and the imperfection of man. Um, but that's coupled with macro, like the overall war. Where, where is the US army at this point? Where are the British? Where, how far have the Russians made it into Berlin? Um, so it's, it's got both of these where she talks about, I mean, it's, it's, just, it's interesting, like perfume, makeup, anything that seems like not part of the persecution. She talks about lipstick as being, uh, it represents the world outside the camp. Um, so, uh, but at the same time, all of it, she calls artificial life. Um, so things like the SS approving religious services, they can have religious services, or there are these storefronts in the camp that are full of goods that no, nobody can purchase. Uh, there's uh, another question about, uh, or not a question, I just saw a question pop up on my, my screen here. Um, or she talks about people remembering when the Red Cross first came and the children were trained to run up to the SS and say like, dear Uncle Ron, have you come to see us again? It's this Potemkin village surrealness that I think really comes through doctors who don't have any medicine. Um, goods that are handed out that they can only use if the Red Cross comes like curtains for their windows. Or maybe the best example of this is at the end of the war, she receives this weird letter of recommendation for her work in Zentral Evidence. Like Eva Noak Masi was employed, employed. It's a slave labor. It's not, it's not, it's not yeah, at signed, will employment. Signed by an SS officer, right? Yeah, I mean, there's really, I, one of the things that makes it so surreal, right, is not just her her sort of unique position having come in late, and the, the fact that, you know, she can see the outside world, right, there is some sort of contact with the outside world, whether it's news leaking in about the Allied advance, whether it's new people coming into the camp as the Nazis empty other camps and funnel them into Theresien Stadt, uh, you know, but at the same time, you've got the reality of camp life, and then you've got this sort of faux Potemkin camp life, right? You know, she draws that connection herself because, of course, they all know about Potemkin villages from, from the interwar press, right? So, yeah. so, and because she's a journalist, right? She writes really sort of both poetically and incisively critically about this sort of strange, uh, you know, you put it, with by saying surreal right this surreal sort of uh layered reality of of the camp right that moment where she is is looking out uh standing on the camp walls is really poetic and, and sort of heartbreaking in a way what, one of the things that was the most striking uh to me is once she's finally out of the camp and she's you know before she's headed back to germany she's wandering around the fields that uh you know jews were executed for picking one piece of fruit, right? These were fields to grow fruit and vegetables for SS officers. And now all of the produce is rotting on the vine because there are no 
Jewish workers to carry out the sort of slave labor of farming. Uh, and so, you know, it, it really is because it straddles, I think, that particular moment. It really is, uh, in a lot of ways, elements of the account are very surreal. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, so we, we have a question here, and, and I want to sort of touch on it because uh, it's an interesting question, right? And, and we want to sort of talk about... Um, you know, I want to circle back around and talk about sort of the end of the, the memoir and, and Ava's attitudes. But the question was, was there evidence of women having relations with officers uh, within the camp? And this is a great question in a way because the camp is really uh, very much divided along the lines of gender, right? Women li live together, uh, you know, uh, men live together, they live separately, right? If there are children in the camp, they're in a segregated area, right? Um, Sky, do you wanna, do you wanna speak to this question of, of sort of the relationship between men and women and, uh, and the camp administration more broadly? Um, it says on here that Oren Steer is gonna answer this question live. Oren, did you wanna answer it or is that just mean you've marked it? No, that's an accident. Please go no. ahead. Okay. Um, there's in other Theresienstadt memoirs or accounts, there, there's evidence of, 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 of this sort of this fraternization, especially among like the Czech gendarmes and who are auxiliary soldiers to the SS and camp inmates. But in Ava's account, no, um, that's not, that's, she doesn't talk about that as uh, something that, that she witnesses or encounters. Um, this is, this is I, I should say, a controversial issue in the historiography yeah. right now, right? Historians are debating this. There are some historians who have said that there are relationships between, uh, you know, guards and people in the camp. Uh, the thing that's really striking, though, about this memoir is uh, there seems to at all times be a wall between the camp personnel. She sort of mentions very briefly at, at the very end of her account, once the SS guards are gone, then there's sort of a warming of relationships with you know, some of the Czech guards who are serving to administer the camp. Uh, but before that, you know, there seems to be this total sort of segregation that, that dominates. Well, it's also, I think it's interesting for, for, for the Noak Masi perspective because she's German. Mm -hmm. so. There's an attitude, I mean, from the very beginning of Theresienstadt of the Germans as lumping together Nazis and the victims of Nazis as just those, those people. Um, so she, she talks about this as well. And so do other, other Germans who are put, put into the camp about, they don't understand why they're being sort of grouped by their fellow inmates, whether they're from Austria or uh, Czechoslovakia or other places in Eastern Europe as all being the same when clearly they're all wearing yellow stars and she's not getting any rations that are different. She's working as much as everyone else. So it doesn't, but those ethnic tensions or those national tensions continue or are perpetuated. Um, I mean, we were, we were talking about sort of surreal moments, right? Uh, a little bit earlier and there is a right. very surreal moment at the beginning when she arrives uh, you know, and it's pointed out to her that, you know, Germans are sort of considered differently. And also she's brought her dirndl, right? Her yeah. German folk outfit, because that's sort of one of the warmest dresses uh, that she has. And she's informed very quickly that, you know, Jews are not allowed to wear German folk costumes and she has yeah. to rip all of the embroidery off of the dress. And so there is this really clear sort of distinction, right? Uh, b between the, 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 prisoners of various nationalities that, you know, Germans are set apart. And it sort of fits with Ava's own identity as a German, right? She doesn't yeah. uh, really see herself as being separate from the rest of Germany. Right. And that, I mean, there's another moment, I think. So after Paul Dunant shows up and the camp administration is turned over to the International Red Cross, all of these German signs are torn down and check signs put up. But then it turns out German's the lingua franca. That's what most people can read and understand. So they have to go back and recreate German signs to put back. Um, so it's, yeah, that's another one of these, these very strange moments for, for, for Noach Masi. Um, so, so 
one of the things I wanted to touch on, since we sort of talked about, you know, the, the ending and how the memoir diary stretches into the period after Theresienstadt is, is technically liberated, right? But before people can leave because they're having this typhus outbreak. Uh, you know, I was really struck in her memoir by her sort of optimistic note. She ends on this intense note of optimism. She's, she, this optimism sort of ebbs and wanes throughout the diary, you know, because life is very tough, but she ends on this very optimistic note, right? She ends with this by saying, I'm not afraid any longer. What should I be afraid of? I don't hate people. I've received too much kindness from them. And this is really striking, right? If you read Primo Levi, who talks about the drowned and the saved, you yeah. have a much more sort of pessimistic view. And, and I realize that Theresienstadt is not Auschwitz, but it's sort of, right. uh, you know, what do you think accounts for this optimism in, in her account? It's, it's very, you know, uh, I just got done teaching Tadeusz Borowski, for example, to my, to my undergraduate students a couple of weeks ago. It's very striking in a, in a way. Um. Well, I, it's tricky. I mean, there's, there's, there's a, there are, of course, still, even after she arrives, there are a lot of reasons to be, to, wow. to despair in Theresienstadt and for the inhabitants to, to despair. Um, as, as, as to your question, I think part of its personality and part of its context. So mm -hmm. she does know the war is going poorly for Germany when she leaves. She and her husband, Moritz, figure out based on where the front lines are, that it's really unlikely the Third Reich is gonna be able to hold out through the summer, through the entire summer of 1945. So she has that in the back of her mind as, as, the, the, as, as how long she needs to survive in the camp. Now that's challenged immediately when she arrives because someone who's helping her um, into the sluice asks what news of the war and she says, just a matter of months, and he sighs and says, yes, I've heard that for over two years now. Um, but she also makes a deal with herself after some really hard days, initial days in the camp, that she's going to just not despair for 100 days. Um, so she's going to try to find things to focus on that are more positive in this impossible situation um, to make it through 100 days. And it turns out that 100 days gets her through the death of Mussolini, the death of Hitler, and the, the surrender, the Nazi surrender. Um, some of the things that she, she focuses on, not only we can think again about her walking the, the battlements, because Theresienstadt was a fortress, and looking out over the countryside, but she also, she focuses on birds that are being born in the camp and this like quality of life among so much death. Um, she comes to really admire the inmates who have been there for years already and how they have found ways, ways to survive um, and ways to preserve their dignity, um, yeah. to not give in to, to, to the persecution of, of the camp. So I think it's both. It's sort of that she knows that the war is, there is an end in sight. She's able to listen to the BBC in Oberstdorf, but there's also, um, as part of her personality, she's somewhat upbeat. Um, despite despite the context yeah it's really uh it's you know it's it's an interesting account because by all means she spends you know a lot of time sort of collecting evidence of persecution collecting evidence of, of the crimes that are being perpetrated but also really you know drives home this sort of sense of survivorship this sort of sense of of community survival of maintaining not just your life, even though that's a statistical minority, right? But also maintaining dignity in, in, in the face of, of these awful crimes. Um, you know, before we go on, I want to I want to open it up to the audience out there because I know we've had one question come up, but I want to make sure that we give plenty of time to answer uh, questions that you might have about Eva Noak Masi, about Theresienstadt, about uh, the Masi family, uh, any of those topics. I think also while we're waiting for maybe some questions to come in, I thought I might uh, jump back in and ask one Please of my do. own, if that's okay. I, I, ha I have a whole bunch, but the first one that comes to mind, just thinking about that image of Ava walking along the battlements. I, one of the controversial issues when we look at uh, survivor memoirs and testimonies is there th this, this complicated status of, of so-called privileged prisoners, right? Those who had certain kinds of 
protectia, a certain kind of uh, access that, that not, not all prisoners had. Sky, I'm wondering what you can, what you can say about, I'm, I'm really interested in Ava's perspective on sure. that. Well, um, it's a good question. So in, in Theresienstadt, there are like, there are the prominent, the prominent, um, but she's not prominent despite coming from, from her family. She's put in general, whatever we want to call it, general barracks with, with a large, with a large group of women, you know, they have things like a single tap for over a hundred people. They all have to be at work at 4 30, 5 30, 6 30 in the morning. Um, she's allotted the same number of postcards. Now that changes for her partway through, through being in the camp because she's friends with Trude Zulze. Um, and so she, the, as the camp begins to fill with, with refugees and with um, other Holocaust victims who are off arriving after being forced on death marches from camps further east or from camps outside of Berlin, there's pressure, even more pressure on housing. And so she's able to negotiate through bribery being assigned into one of the so-called prominent houses. And that affords her, so she sleeps on the floor basically of this kitchen in Trudezutz's room. And that affords her things like no roll call. No, she, there's no random roll call. There's one tap for 30 people instead of a hundred people, um, et cetera. Um, her cousin, Martha Massey, who's in the camp, has, has been designated prominent for the entire two years she's there. But that's because Martha Massey's, that was because of the Japanese who put pressure on the Nazis to make sure that she wasn't killed because it was her, um, her grandfather, Albert Massey, who helped with the, with the Japanese um, constitution. And, Mar and actually this comes up for Ava because while she's still living in Berlin, there are these two Japanese businessmen who call her based on her last name and want help to find Ma Albert Mossy's grave um, so that they can pay their respects. Mm -hmm. But there is a moment of tension between prominent and, and everyone else. Now being designated prominent doesn't mean anything. And she, Ava's very, I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean anything for survivorship. She knows this because like Richard Israel her uncle was a first world war veteran, was an adjutant to um, Hindenburg. He was sent to Theresienstadt as a world war one veteran was designated prominent. He was still killed in 1943, um, which she figures out while she's there. Um, it's, but that's, that's another like way that the camp's really strange because basically the Nazis send people there that they're they're, they're more nervous about facing international criticism for killing than um, others. So that's why there's such a rich cultural life because there are so many internationally well-known artists, mm -hmm. um, authors, et cetera, who are, who are sent there. And they are given that prominent status, but many of them still die. They have the same rations. Um, so it's a, there's a limit and it, she has a very unique perspective also because the camp has been so depopulated, like I mentioned earlier. So there's, um, so for example, in her barracks at the height of the, the, the overcrowding, even the attic had over a hundred people in it. And when she's there, the attic's completely empty. Um, so, but it's a great question. Um, and actually, um, Adler, uh, Hage Adler's book on Trace Inchdot has some really, a really good discussion. And there's an English edition that I think came out two years ago. It's just called Trace Inchdot. Um, but he also became a historian. He became a historian after, after the war um, and worked in England. I think one of the things that's really fascinating about the account is, is how privileged Eva Noak Mossy's experience is in a lot of ways, right? It's not representative. Uh, and that's maybe part of the reason why we have her memoir. I mean, that's, you know, and as, as Oren well knows, right, this is a, a, a sort of a common uh, denominator amongst many people who are able to testify, right, is that they have unique circumstances for whatever reason that allow yeah. them to survive, you know, and, and Ava has really a, a combination of unique circumstances, right? She's married to an Aryan. He doesn't divorce her. They manage to persist by moving to a smaller town. Uh, you know, she has friends in the camp who can 
allow her to move into better living quarters. You know, it's it's a sort of manifold uh, things that that make her experience unique and not representative of other people who are interned in the camp and and who do not survive, right? But you know, at the same time, it allows us to have this historical source that can give us some right. insight into that experience. Right. You know, I wanted to actually ask Sky if you could get back to that issue of the source, the nature of the source itself, yeah. and particularly the act of translating it. You know, it's so fascinating because a lot of people, I think, um, just sort of naturally assume that a, a diary is kind of written in the moment and, and is not necessarily edited afterwards. Um, you know, I'm, I'm understanding from Ava's uh, a work that it's not just a combination of, of diary in the moment and retrospective memoir, but also there, there are all these other elements of kind of self reflection and ability to look back that, that, that not only takes into account that's that, that, that privileged voice, you, you know, that the fact that we often forget that the testimonies that we have um, are by and large from people who survived, right? We have, we have far fewer, um, uh, diaries and accounts from people who, who you know, who, who were murdered, obviously the most notable is, is, is Anne Franks. So yeah. I'm wondering what, what kind of the, the, that, the, her craft of writing and your craft of translating it, what that experience was like, yeah. your perspective on it. it. It was really tricky because it's all on these, like, it's all just type set blocks of text. Um, that, that we had both at the Wiener Library and at the, the uh, Leo Beck Institute. Um, she has this short preface that says that she has corroborated what she found in Zentral Evidence with Adler's book on, on the camp. Um, so that means that she's tinkering with it um, right up to the end of the 40s, basically. Um, in order to make sure that all of the numbers that she's found are correct. And there are little, there, there are slight discrepancies, but overall what she sees is correct. The, it was a difficult decision to try to, to offset what's for sure future knowledge with italics because we knew we would never get all of it, right? We would only be hitting the really, really obvious things. Like I mentioned the postcard um, or she has a few asides about, and that person survived or and that person was arrested um, and that's 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 for sure future knowledge but it it is there a lot of the text is this mix and we'll never we'll never fully know um, but there's there is also an immediacy and one of the things that was interesting there is that verb tense wasn't necessarily useful I tried to use that mm -hmm. for a while but it didn't it didn't always hold that past tense meant this and future tense or present tense meant she was commenting on that because she does seem to jot down a lot of these like short exchanges she has with individuals on the train in the camp in central mm -hmm. evidence. And I, I have to believe she's writing those the day of. Um, and so those are all in the present tense, but there's no, there's no hundred percent way to, to, to ultimately um, excavate or disentangle the, um, it, it makes me think about, I don't, there's, there's another, Treisenstadt diary by Gonda Redlich. He is deported. He, is, he oversees the children, the children's programming. He's deported and killed. Um, and his is found, his diary is found in an attic much later. And that's very present, but it's also very short. Like there's these really short daily entries. Um, so it's a different kind of source. But you are both right. It's rare. I mean, it is a privileged thing to have survived. Um, and it's a privileged position. Uh, to be sitting in Oberstdorf uh, and then in Munich after the war and to be thinking back on, on the experiences. She's really frustrated after the war um, not to drift because she, she wants to get it published, but there's no public appetite in Germany to hear from. She calls them these lame ducks in Germany who want to pretend nothing happened. And so she only gets like, she publishes different pieces in like Die Tat about yeah. the diet, like, this was a little bit of my experience. Um, uh, we have another question here. Yeah, and actually we have a, a great question from Chad Gibbs who says, I'm curious about where you all see Noah Mossy diary memoir as educators. Would you assign it in a Holocaust course as a primary reading? And if so, what aspect of Holocaust history would you want students to take from Ava's writing? 
Um, you know, and actually, this is one of the first things I thought of as I read the memoir, uh, you know, and I don't want to go on at length because I want to give, you know, Sky a chance to respond and, and Oren as well, uh, you know, given Oren's specialty in, in, in remembrance. Uh, you know, one of my first thoughts is that this would actually make a great teaching tool in part because of the conversation we're having right now, right? It's a very complicated text in the sense of parsing out the difference between memory and uh, what's written in the moment in parsing out sort of Ava Noak Masi's subject position, right? And so it would be great to talk about survivorship, to talk about memory and how our knowledge of the Holocaust is shaped uh, by the people who do survive, right? You know, and it's even more complicated given the fact that Eva Noak Masi is a journalist and she really writes like a journalist, right? Yeah. I think part of the reason why the text is so compelling is because she does that thing that journalists do where they provide something really concrete and compelling that really sets the scene and then sort of zooms out and draws conclusions. And she's doing that sort of as she's writing about her own yeah. experience. So in a way, she's a hard narrator to sort of get around. And so I think, you know, for teaching, uh, it would be a, a great tool. And I'll, I'll leave it there because we have just a couple minutes left if you guys want to. Uh, yeah, add. Oren. Yeah, why don't you? And then I'll, I can. Uh, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, largely defer to you just to acknowledge uh, Chad himself is uh, engaged in a lot of, the, you know, the really important work in trying to make sense of what was going on in these different camp situations at the time. And, it, you know, the other, only other thing I, I, I'll say, which I, you know, I don't want to take away Sky from you. I want you to have the last word. But one of the things I find most fascinating about this is just the fact that it's, it's 1945. I mean, it's, it's a chaotic year in a series of chaotic years, but it's, a, and, and, and the fact that it bridges over that kind of end of the war where everything was just falling apart left and right. And, you know, our sources are really, are really uh, often compromised uh, because of that. And so I think yeah. that's one of the reasons why it's just so, so interesting. But, you know, would that we could use, you know, dozens and dozens of, of sources in our classes, right? That would be, that would yeah. be great. Um, I guess, Chad, if I'm being candid, if, I ha if, I, if the whole class is on the Holocaust, then yes, I think there's absolutely a space for this book. But if you only have one week to cover the Holocaust, perhaps you're, you're going to wind up choosing a different, a different text because there are so many to choose from that, that, will, that, you know, that drive at different themes that are really important um, for those weeks. Uh, I agree with Oren. It's really fascinating because you go from the Russians also to the Americans and you get a real sense from Ava about how different they are from the Russian commandant who's really rigid uh, but very professional to the American soldiers playing with oranges while they're like directing traffic in this broken down infrastructure landscape. And that I think is really interesting. Um, I, that, that moment of chaos is, is also really, I think, important to cover. And it's interesting you see in Ava how Holocaust survivors partner with arriving art, armies to start working towards resolving uh, immediately the day, uh, the day the armies arrive this insanity, this logistical quagmire, one conversation, one telegram, one letter at a time, trying to help people find their loved ones, trying to help people find a way to get back home. Uh, that's, mm. she gets really into that. She leaves a pile of telegrams. She talks about unanswered and she feels really bad about that, but she wants to go home back to Oberstdorf. Um, one thing that I think we can take from Noak Mossy that we can take from a lot of Holocaust memoirs is this sense that it's important to share their stories. I mean, Ava uh, concludes with this, um, the sense that she's writing, she writes down what happens to her because she feels a debt to all of the, all of the people on those index cards who didn't survive. Um, and that she, she writes it down to make sure that what, what, it, what she saw and what the crimes that she witnessed cannot happen again. Um, maybe I'll just leave it at that. I think, uh, I think that's a, a terrific place to end. Uh, obviously, there's so much more to say, um, but uh, we're out of our, our allotted time, and uh, we appreciate so much our, our audience and the questions. Um, uh, Terry, thanks so much for moderate, moderating, and Sky, of course, thank you so much for for this work and um, for your dedication to it. I just wanna thank again our co-sponsors for today's program, uh, uh, sponsored primarily by the FIU Holocaust and Genocide Studies program in 
the Stephen J. Green School of International and Public Affairs, along with Books and Books, Jewish Museum of Florida, FIU, Ruth K. and Shepard Broad Distinguished Lecture Series. Yes, there's the book and you can purchase it, I'm sure, through Books and Books online yeah. portal. Uh, the European and Eurasian Studies Program, the Václav Havel Program for Human Rights and Dis Diplomacy in the FIU Department of History. On behalf of all of us, uh, thank you uh, both. Thank you to the audience uh, and thank you so much. Have a good day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.